I also want to show you a selection of Byzantine manuscripts. Uh, most of these are going to be from the 10th century, and that was a period in which um, many manuscripts were created. Uh, we believe that these all came from the Imperial Scriptorium in Constantinople. We've mentioned the Macedonian dynasty from the 9th and 10th century. And this period saw a renewal in manuscript illumination and very interestingly, uh, manuscripts that seem to have a lot of classical influence in the style. Now, this happened particularly during the 10th century. So sometimes we talk about this as either the Macedonian Renaissance, uh, revival of classical antiquity, or the 10th century Renaissance, as we're going to be seeing. Um, most of these uh, images date from the 10th century. Um, it is believed to correspond with the reopening of uh, the uh, academy in Constantinople uh, after iconoclasm. And this meant that there was now access and interest in ancient Greek texts and you would have both Christian texts and classical texts. The ones I'm going to be showing you will all be Christian texts. because That's what survives. Um, but the images are quite interesting. Okay, first we're going to look at the homilies. Homilies are sermons of Gregory of uh, Nazianzus, or St. Gregory Nazianzus. Uh, he was a, I think, fourth century saint. Uh, but his uh, sermons, of course, were copied down and, and could be read. And so this is the late 9th century. Um, it's just one page from many illustrated pages uh, of the manuscript in Paris. In the Bibliothèque Nationale is written in Greek, so it has a number. Uh, and the scene that we're looking at is Ezekiel in the Valley of the Dry Bones. And as you can see, it is damaged, so it's a little hard to see. Um, I'll have one detail where the, the color seems to have been hyped a bit. Uh, but you can read the story in Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. Uh, Ezekiel is in this valley of uh, dried skeletal pieces of bones. And uh, when we look close at it, you're going to see these uh, kind of stylized skulls and bones uh, uh, there in the middle. Um, and a great wind comes out, Ezekiel has a vision of God, and the bones take on flesh and come to life again. So, as you might well imagine, this becomes an Old Testament prefiguration of Christ raising Lazarus, or even more so, uh, the Old Testament prefiguration of the resurrection of Christ, you know, coming back to life. Um, we see Ezekiel twice, uh, up uh, communing with God, and then below, walking in the Valley of the Dry Bones with uh, an angel uh, that's accompanying him. It is a kind of interesting combination, once again, of illusionism and abstraction. Uh, there are certainly some illusionistic elements that we would think might come from an earlier manuscript. And this is what we think was happening. Uh, the scriptorium was opening up and people were able to look at uh, early Christian manuscripts uh, or maybe even early Byzantine manuscripts that still copied the class classical illusionistic tradition of making figures uh, seem three-dimensional and yet they're copying them. And so you'll usually see them being harder edged and they're bringing to them the knowledge of the drawing and painting styles of that day. So what you'll see is many images that seem to be very classical and yet the proportions may be Byzantine as you see here, the elongated proportions, and the drapery folds often are very linear, sometimes very angular, uh, and there frequently are outlines around the figures. So let's look at some of the things here. Oh, okay, we have, should have. The sky is shown in a variety of colors. Uh, which makes it very atmospheric. Uh, their draperies do seem to wrap the body. You might notice particularly with this, this angel, we can sort of see, um, you can see an angel has legs, I guess so. <laughs> um, the angel's legs and uh, abdomen and uh, various parts of the body seem to almost show through. 
and uh, there are lines that try to uh, wrap the thigh uh, of, uh, of the prophet. If you look very closely, and there is a period, part of damage uh, to the left, but uh, look at the hem of the angel's garment. It seems to flutter. It's uh, very energetic, all of those lines. And you know, this was going to remind us of something like a classical Nike figure, uh, the, wi the winged victory uh, that would always have fluttering draperies and a wing. Um, so there are some elements, certainly they're very classical. You see the angel seems to stride. Uh, the figures can turn in space. And yet there are some other things. Uh, you have the sort of iceberg mountains where you have a flat top uh, and then uh, the cliff comes straight down, very cubic except uh, you know, they go out and in at the top. Uh, it's what we call the Byzantine iceberg mountains. Uh, and as I mentioned, the draperies uh, are essentially lines for the folds of the draperies. Uh, they might be a dark line accompanied with a white line, which is supposed to be a highlight, uh, but we read it as line. And uh, sometimes it's very, very angular forms as well. So once again, what we think is happening is someone is copying a more classicizing manuscript uh, illumination and inserting, uh, you know, so copy it. A lot of times when copy is copy, uh, they get harder. Uh, they start uh, outlining. Incidentally, in this detail, you can see those little heads that are supposed to be the skulls of the, uh, and, the and the bones uh, from the Valley of the Dry Bones, uh, sort of on the mountainside, actually. One of the most classicizing of these 10th century manuscripts is the Paris Psalter. Uh, a Psalter is uh, what it sounds like, a book of psalms. And David was believed to be the author of the Book of Psalms. Uh, this contains many, many illustrations. I'm just going to show you a few. Um, one of the most famous is this one. David uh, as the author of the Psalms. So this is the author portrait. And he's creating the Psalms by playing on his harp or his lyre. Uh, the figure next to him, sort of uh, leaning on his shoulder, it looks to us like a, a classical muse. Uh, but she's labeled. So she is the personification of melody. So since we can't hear his melody, we see his melody. Uh, it's known as the Paris Psalter because it is in Paris in the Bibliothèque Nationale, the National Library. And once again, of course, like all these Byzantine manuscripts, it's a Greek manuscript. I'll show you here. Um, I had several reproductions. I think that the one you just saw is probably a little, uh, I have never seen it, of course, um, but it's probably darker. This was my uh, new images. And you can see that the image is framed uh, in what almost looks to be a, a painting of a weaving. That's very interesting. Uh, and then uh, you can see it placed on the page. And of course, we're going to look up closer to it, uh, cutting away some of the empty spaces. When you look at this, if you didn't know it was David, you might think, for just a minute anyway, that it was Orpheus. Uh, classical Orpheus playing to the animals. These animals, of course, are David's flocks. And it really does have a tremendous number of illusionistic elements believed to be copied from an earlier Christian manuscript, uh, which was more illusionistic um, and is very, very high quality. Um, even, uh, even, if it, even if we're assuming it's a copy, they copied it very well with the addition of some uh, Middle Byzantine um, stylistic traits. Okay, so you have a landscape. I mean, the whole thing is set in a landscape that really does seem to go back into depth. Uh, you've got a foreground, a middle ground, a background, and the background is uh, very atmospheric. You can see the city of Bethlehem, uh, the city of David behind, which is the blue and the blue mountains. And the tree is painted uh, very impressionistically. Um, I always think back to catacomb paintings, for example. Uh, the figures certainly uh, seem to be solid. They can turn in space. They have all sorts of uh, contraposto positions. You can see David turning one way, uh, Melody, Melodia, uh, you know, in a in nice contraposto. And you can see the figure down at the lower right corner, this uh, semi-nude figure, uh, who's, you know, also is able to turn his head and. Uh, 
raise his arm and uh, bring up his legs, so they, they do seem to be uh, existing in space. One thing is that this is just full of classical personifications. We've already mentioned melodia or melody, uh, personified by a female figure that reminds us perhaps of uh, a nymph, or uh, I always look at her, I think of her as being the muse of, uh, of David. Uh, but you may have noticed that there's a little lady behind a uh, broken off uh, column that's wrapped with a, a, a cloth, a scarf, a tie, uh, and she's peeking out as, as though she's, oh, I'm really enjoying the music that David's making, and, but I'm staying back here in the background. Um, well, she is labeled as well, and she is Echo. Um, so, you know, the hills are, the, the hills, you can see a little bit of the hills here, the hills are alive with the sound of music and the sound is echoing off. Uh, so once again, we're sort of giving, uh, you can't hear it, but we have the personification of sound echoing from the hills. Uh, and then it's very interesting, we have both the city of David labeled Bethlehem, which, of course, is the city of David, um, and in blue and you know, atmospheric. Uh, and then we also have, uh, well, we have the city up in the upper left corner, and then we have in the lower right corner the personification. He looks to me like a classical river god. It seems to me that that's the, the kind of uh, image, perhaps, that, that he might have been taken from. Um, the pose, as you might notice, is similar to the pose that you've seen with Endymion or even Jonah with the, him reclining. Here he's a little more scrunched up, his legs are raised higher, but he's got that one hand over his head, which you saw in some of the Jonah images and Endymion images. Um, and now that we're looking closely to him, I want you to notice something. He's outlined. There's dark line all around the body. And there's uh, indication of musculature and the pectorials, and, uh, but they are in sort of, uh, there's some shading, certainly, you know, he's shaded, but there are uh, uh, a tendency to add linearity. So something that is extremely naturalistic or is reflections. And look at his, uh, his leg. You have the reflections of light shown as parallel white strokes on his shin. So that's very interesting because it seems to be as though you've got something very naturalistic or classicizing or illusionistic, and yet it's rendered as line. It's rendered in the abstract. So probably what's happening is they're copying the image and then just you know, taking those little white strokes as, as lines. As the highlights become lines. So this is what we call the 10th century Renaissance. We have a classicizing model copied in the Byzantine Empire. So all of those classical elements, and yet at the same time, we have Byzantine linearity. Uh, each of the figures is outlined, uh, the drapery folds become linear and angular, and as we just saw, even the highlights might become lines. So let's take a closer look at some of these images. Uh, here we're looking at a close up as, at David and Melody, and you can see they, they're modeled, but look at David's calf, for example. There seems to be an area that is light, there seem to be some of those white lines that are the highlights, and then you have a middle color, and then you have the outlines of the darker color. Uh, if you look at the drapery, let's take a look at uh, Melodia's drapery, particularly the, uh, the gold section, because you can see that very clearly. Um, it's angular lines that make up the folds. Um, one of the things that I thought, however, that is very, very classicizing is David's flocks. You see both sheep and goats. Uh, you do see them sort of on top of the water rather than perhaps uh, with their feet uh, in the water. But at the same time, you're seeing figures that overlap. You're seeing a goat from the rear. Um, you're seeing foreshortening. 
you're seeing uh, shading of the uh, light uh, forms and, and dark forms that really make the, the sheep look three-dimensional. They have a rounded haunch and a rounded barrel of the body. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's really remarkably illusionistic. Uh, you also see the dog. Uh, this is uh, David's herding dog. You have to have a herding dog, I guess, uh, when you've got flocks to watch over. So they, they do turn in space. And then the one thing that says copy, of course, is the, uh, there is an outline. Uh, but it does seem to me that the, uh, the animals are very freely uh, painted to give you the illusion that they're three-dimensional. I'll just show you a few more examples from the Parasalter. Uh, here we see Moses parting the Red Sea. Uh, Moses is uh, elongated, uh, very angular folds. Uh, he strides forward. Uh, he's outlined. And yet look down at uh, the destruction of Pharaoh's army. Uh, that is really interesting. You have the figure is half in and half out of the water. You have one that uh, looks like a muscular nude from the back. Uh, and uh, another personification uh, of the female figure here. Um, the story of David and Goliath. Uh, and at the top, we have the battle of David and Goliath, and then uh, we have the decapitation uh, of, uh, of Goliath by David below. And presumably the uh, two armies who are overlapped here with the helmets are the uh, Hebrew and the Philistine army, I would imagine. Now, you also notice that there's personifications. Everybody's labeled. And the uh, personification of the female figure who is running away from Goliath. It looks like she's fleeing the battle side. Uh, she is boasting. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's in Greek, but that's how I would translate. Uh, so presumably, you know, Goliath went out and boasted that he could defeat any champion that the Israelites sent against him. Uh, but uh, that bravado flees uh, when he's confronted with the actual battle. Uh, you see Joe, uh, David, uh, actually David looks to be in danger here. I always think of him as standing back and throwing stones, but here uh, it looks like Goliath is actually throwing a spear at him, uh, which David is uh, able to duck or uh, uh, to lean away from. Uh, it does give you the feeling of a very energetic battle scene. People are uh, striding forward, leaning back. Uh, leaning forward. Um, they are in uh, action. A lot of diagonal movement. The figure behind David is dynamis, which means strength. So he is given the strength of God in order to defeat the giant. And we talked about the dynamic action. Uh, you might also notice the same kind of thing we talked about in detail with uh, David uh, as a psalmist. Uh, is you have your shading, you have your areas of shading, uh, but also you have uh, some linearity involved with that. And uh, here we see David cutting off uh, Goliath's head uh, with a really strong outline around the form. But notice how the drapery flutters. Uh, really very, very active scene. Here a little later in David's life uh, is David's penance. Uh, you may remember that David uh, fell in love with uh, Bathsheba, who was the wife of his principal general, Uriah. And to uh, make Bathsheba a widow, he sent Uriah to the front lines of the battle where he was certain he would be killed, and he was. Uh, the prophet Nathan confronts David. Um, he tells him that this was a great sin, and he gives an analogy. You know, he said, David, you know, you could have almost any woman you want. You know, you don't have to take somebody else's wife, essentially. But well, he does it with an analogy. He talks about the poor man who has one little ewe lamb whom he loves. It's his only wealth. And the rich man who has flocks, just many, many, many sheep, comes in and takes the ewe lamb from the man who has only one. And David gets it. He actually says, what I did was wrong. And as you can see, he prostrates himself uh, to God and uh, repents. 
Um, I've always wondered, though, he didn't have to give up Bathsheba. How, <laughs> how much of this is a repentance? But the deed was done. We're looking now at a very interesting manuscript uh, from the 10th century. It's now in the Vatican Library. And one of the things that's particularly interesting about it is that it is a roll or a scroll, or to use the Latin word rotulus, more than one would be rotuli. Now, I'm not showing you here a picture of the real Joshua roll. Uh, I found this image on the web of someone who had created a facsimile, and uh, they were selling facsimile, uh, but as you can see, they have uh, put it in the format of a roll. Uh, have, uh, so I thought that this would indicate a roll to you. This is a controversial work because it is a roll or a scroll. Now, as you know, during the Roman Empire, uh, books were scrolls. You roll them up, roll them out to read them. They were on papyrus, which is paper made out of the reeds, the papyrus reeds that, uh, of ancient Egypt. But when the Roman Empire broke up and uh, when trade with Egypt uh, was no longer really viable, um, books had to be written on parchment because there was no paper manufacturer. So this is kind of interesting. It's a roll, but it's on parchment, which is animal skin. And so they've had to uh, attach, presumably glue, uh, different pe pieces of animal skin together to make this continuous roll. Well, parchment doesn't roll very easily. There's no really practical reason to make a parchment roll. So there are several theories about this. One is that it's an original work created in the uh, 10th century. Another is that it is a copy of an early Christian rotulus, which survived to the 10th century, uh, was in the, uh, the library at Constantinople, and uh, is being copied, possibly copied with some variants. So let's look at some of the things uh, that uh, would be classicizing and some of the things that would be Byzantine. It shows the story of Joseph. It's a brown ink drawing. And you can see that places, particularly in the landscape, they've used washes. This is a uh, thin ink as water mixed with the ink. So it gives a more atmospheric effect. And we know that uh, in Roman artwork, they like to have uh, atmospheric landscapes. So that's a, a classical element. Um, it is a continuous narrative. And as you can see, uh, you have the text written below each scene. And then each scene is divided uh, with a, a bit of landscape uh, from the other. So you see this uh, edge of the mountain coming down and uh, covering up a little bit of the troops. Uh, and then on the other side, you see uh, the, uh, the mountain coming down again with the, the city of Jericho behind us, behind it. Um, so you can see where the scenes are divided, but they aren't divided with frames or something very rigid. It's, it is continuous, like it would be on a roll. And beneath each scene is written the text. It's freely drawn with very sure strokes. It has this atmospheric quality in the landscape. Uh, and something else it has is the classical personifications. If you look uh, in this section, the upper left, uh, you see a reclining figure holding uh, a cornucopia or a vessel. And this is a river god or a personification of a river. So that's a very classical thing to do. Uh, if you look down to the lower right, you're seeing this woman uh, who actually has a, a halo around her head. Um, and she's seated there in contraposto. She's turning one way, her knees are going one way, her torso is going the other. And she's uh, just below the city of Jericho. She's a personification of the city. Uh, also, you see, as we mentioned here, figures that can turn in space. Uh, they seem to you know, have that quality about them. And you see the overlapping of the soldiers. Uh, even the costume uh, reminds us of, of Roman soldier wear. 
uh, that they would wear sh uh, short tunics, for example. I'm not sure how much of that would continue into the Byzantine Empire, though. So I can't say whether that's an anachronism or historical for the 10th century as well. Certainly this shows knowledge of classical examples. However, there are some indications that this is a Byzantine manuscript, besides the very fact that it is made on parchment, uh, in the style. Uh, you have the elongation of figures. You have the linearity. All of these figures are outlined. Uh, and then one of the very odd things is that the two spies are making proskinesis. Joshua is shown as though he were an emperor. Uh, he's seated on a throne, uh, even out in the landscape. And as the two spies, these are the two spies um, who went out and uh, scouted the area around Jericho. And they're coming, and you can see here they're starting to get down on their knees, and then they are all the way down on their knees. This is part of a formal Byzantine court ritual that included prostrating oneself before the emperor. It's not a Roman practice. So, some people might argue, well, this has to be you know, created in the 10th century originally. Or some people would just say, well, they added some things from the contemporary world. So, I'll let you decide. It seems to me that uh, this probably, like some of the, since we have so many other works that do seem to be copies of la lost manuscripts, that even if there are some additions, uh, such as the uh, prostration, uh, that it certainly goes back to an earlier manuscript. Uh, here you see Joshua leading the Israelites into battle. And uh, here's just a little detail of the uh, spies uh, setting out. And you can see how the washes are used to create this very atmospheric landscape. And then, of course, as you saw, there's just uh, bits of color that have been added in the garments. Into the 11th century, if we saw the classical revival of the 10th century Renaissance, uh, when we get into the 11th century with the Comenian dynasty, you might talk about Comenian elegance. Uh, these are, uh, you know, of course, Byzantine manuscripts. Uh, and what we're looking at is uh, the Menologian of Basil II. This would be a, a service book. This is the Menologian of Basil II from about the year 1000. Uh, and what you're seeing here is the Archangel Michael uh, against a golden background. Uh, he has defeated the devils who all seem to be falling down at his feet and falling off the mountaintop. Uh, this is a way that is uh, very frequently shown for angels in the Byzantine Empire. Uh, erect, staring out at us with these wonderful wings that come out on either side. Um, and they repeat the shape of the halo. They allow you to have the halo. Uh, you'll notice, once again, very elongated, uh, linear uh, creation of the form. All the draperies are very linear. And uh, here we see the baptism of Christ. Uh, this is something that you'll see frequently is uh, Christ uh, immersed in the water, but we see through the water. We see part of Christ. Uh, so the River Jordan here is quite clear. And the water just seems to go up, but it actually is trying to show you some depth. Uh, you have the whole Trinity with the hand of God the Father sending down the dove of the Holy Spirit who speaks and says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then Christ, uh, as Christians would believe, uh, the incarnated God uh, in the, uh, the water of baptism. Uh, once again, all the figures are elongated. Uh, they feel free to turn in space. Uh, the draperies, however, are made out of line. So what you're seeing with Byzantine art moving towards something more abstract, and we'll see this more in, in perhaps in mosaics, is it's overlaid on classical illusionistic traditions. So Byzantine abstraction will come out of classical illusionism and become more linear, and in some cases, not this one, but in some cases, uh, flattened and more stylized. This one is still showing uh, a great deal of depth and figures that can turn.